Hi, I'm Bonnie Kimke. Welcome to my studio and welcome once again to Quilting on a Thread. We are here in my cutting area and this is where I do major work on my machines so that they're not in the, you know, they're not in my studio. So you will recall from my last video that this is my sister-in-law's 50 year old, so it's a vintage, 50 year old brother pace setter XL703. In its day, this machine was top of the line and it was everything that a home sewist could possibly want. Um, now, you wouldn't quilt on this machine because it only has a six and a half inch throat and the neck is only four and a half inch deep. That would have been very difficult to do anything other than little blocks, quilt as you go. But my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law would do a lot of home crafting on these machines and they made clothes and um, so anyway she was very very proud of this machine she bought it herself after her first job so it's over 50 years old and there were only a few things wrong with it other than all the cams were seized up from not having been used and being stored in an attic so um I used a little bit of benzene, and that's benzene with an I. I don't want you to think that I'm using a carcinogen on anything in my home. Benzene with an I is a cleaning agent, and we use that on machinery to help remove old oil, and then we can relubricate the machine with machine oil. Oil is not meant to be stored in an attic where the temperatures will vary wildly from extreme heat to extreme cold. That's just not the place to store a sewing machine. So for decades of being in that situation, this machine was really in good condition. A few of the things that I found were, as I mentioned before, she was missing her um, backlash spring in her bobbin. Now I couldn't just go out and buy a backlash spring for this bobbin because this bobbin, it, it's vintage, it's that old. But I was able to find on Amazon a um, seller of this vintage bobbin. And there's a, this bobbin is really cute. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but let me get it up here and turn it around. There is a pigtail on that bobbin. I hope you can see that. Maybe if I pull it back a little bit, you can see that pigtail. That actually grabs and guides the thread. So if I put it here where it's in front of my shirt, you can see that better. That actually, after the tensioner on the bobbin, that pigtail grabs and guides the thread. It's a really um, unique bobbin. The other thing that was wrong on her machine or that I noticed on her machine was this donut. This donut is the wheel that sits underneath the bobbin winder. And this thing is deteriorating and ready to fall apart. That would have been a disaster if that fell apart in her machine. I was able to find this also on Amazon and it came in a pack of two. Um, this was a the Dickens to get off and to get this one, you know, get the replacement on was the Dickens. It took myself and my husband. Another thing that had gone on with her machine is this is the extension table and both of her legs, her, her, the tips of her legs were um, broken off. Um, they're little, they were little plastic, not rubber, they were little plastic pieces that sat on and one was completely missing and the other was ready to fall apart. So I was able to, I actually molded that myself with some molding clay. Um, you'll never notice that it's not what, um, you know, that it's not um, as, as delivered, I suppose. And so I'm gonna put this back onto the machine. And when those are in the holes, that steady enough that she can sew. And there you go. So there's a light back here, the light is working. When I first started working with it, I did some of the stitching and I got the stitches and the tension and everything pretty well. And I was pretty pleased with that. 
until I went to her decorative stitches. And this is the mess that were the decorative stitches. That's supposed to be um, a boat. <laughs> It doesn't look like a boat at all. And that's a dog. It doesn't look like a dog at all. Um, I just kept playing with it and playing with it until I started getting it right. It took me two days. Um, that was done not from tension. That's not tension. That's called balance. And that balance is for the second set of bearings and cogs that are up here, the cams that drive the ability for the machine to come go forward and backward on these decorative stitches. And so underneath the top, there is a dial in there. And you very carefully keep adjusting that dial until you get everything um, correct. And so rather than go through every one of the stitches that is on here, I'll just show you that this machine does a series of very decorative stitches. And you'll see there the dog, the fish, uh, some sort of a flower, a peony, a boat, and then these decorative um, satin stitches, if you will. And so it does all of those things and it does it well. Um, so I'll cut away here and give you a moment to see some of what I saw inside this machine. So this is film that I cut from a couple of days ago. And let's just give you a moment to see some of the things that I saw inside this machine. Now, as you can see, there's a lot going on in here. This is a cam system and behind it, you can't really see there's even more camming and I'm not gonna try and get, get you in to see that but I had to oil all of these cams and let them sit so I used a little benzene first to clean out the old oil wiped that out with a brush and then re-oiled and the same thing over here there's another set of cams and I oiled those and all of these places where there's metal on metal I dabbed just a little bit of oil on it and then down here in the bobbin assembly and the drives for that I went in with a brush and some benzene and cleaned off any old oil and then again re-oiled. So you may or may not be able to see all the trickery that's going on in there. Um, but it's kind of neat to see when you don't see this sort of thing all the time. Um, I'm continually brushing things out that as I'm working it that are working their way out of the mechanics because before I close this back up, I of course want everything to be all nice and clean. And her belts are all in good condition. They're not too tight, not too dirty. Um, they have enough give that they still are playful and I've rotated them around to make sure that they're all in good condition. And then when you see this all work, you see all that play around. I'm gonna to have to try and get some of that off. Um, there was a there was a good layer of grime in here, and I keep still sweeping it out. I can't wait till I get the vacuum in here and totally vacuum it out. But as I do a little bit at a time, now you may notice and. I don't know that you can see it, but above this um, gear, if you will, there's a hole. Every machine has that one hole in it. You drop exactly one drop of oil, never any more. And you do that probably about every five years on a motor like this. Um, it ran pretty good when I first just ran it to see, but it was a little loud. And when I put that drop of oil in, let it sit overnight and then ran it, she was quiet as she could be. And it's really, really nice. And um, it was kind of a relief that the motor is very quiet because that means it's operating well. If a motor is clunking and clanking, you have things going on inside the motor that need to be taken care of and 
probably the only way to take care of that is to just replace the motor. This machine is operating pretty darn well for a machine that's been stored badly for years and years and years. Everything is nice and quiet. Okay, so before I demonstrate the machine running, I will tell you that I, there were a couple of other minor issues with the machine. The, um, the shuttlecock in the bobbin area had a burr on it. I was able to just take a, um, just a fingernails, um, uh, let's see, you know, just one of these little square fingernail buffers, and I buffed that burr out. Um, when you find those burrs, it's usually not on the top, it's usually, you know, that shuttlecock is like that, and, and you take your fingernail and you go underneath it, and that's where you find the burr. Well, if you don't get that burr out, it shreds your thread, it breaks your needle, it destroys your stitching. I mean, it just makes your stitches do all kinds of weird things. So I buffed that out, and I replaced her needle, and um, her sharpener, I mean, her... Um, thread cutter here on the side needed to be sharpened so I filed that down and given you know gave that some new life to it and pretty much at this point the machine is ready to go so we kind of expect that a machine will stitch straight and will stitch zigzag so I'm not going to demonstrate that but I'm going to demonstrate some of the interesting stitches that were basically new when this machine came out. People didn't expect to be able to do some of these stitches on a home machine. And so this was really interesting. So let me just um, cut away and I'm gonna bring you over so that you can see what I'm doing on the machine. So I have here the sheet that, I mean, the cloth that I'm gonna give to my sister-in-law so she can see that all of her stitches are working. So obviously I'm not gonna de demonstrate for you the straight stitch, the zigzag, the blind hem, the elastic zigzag, but we're at stitch number 18 here that is a scalloped satin stitch and it's kind of an interesting stitch. So anytime I'm gonna change stitches, I make sure, let me pull this up a little bit. Anytime I'm going to um, change any stitch, I make sure that the needle is all the way up and that the uptake lever is all the way up. And that's just so that I don't hurt anything on the mechanics of the machine. So I've already depressed the um, cam gear um, enabler, if you will, and selected the stitch to 18. Now it tells me that it wants it to be at fine, so I'll move that to fine. And then I want, of course, to select a wide stitch so that that will um, show up. So then, now that we're there and everything is in place, we just go ahead and sew. going to speed up a little bit here so that we get this done faster. raise my presser foot and the uptake lever.
Now that's the satin stitch that's kind of a scalloping and it's supposed to have that appearance to it. It's a, um, if you look in the book, it has that um, sort of an appearance. And so then I'm going to do this diagonal, I mean this triangular satin stitch, which is number 17. And then we'll leave the same settings. So again, uptake lever and needle were both up when I started this. And there you see the two satin stitches that I've done so far. And I'm going to cut, cut away and finish some of these satin stitches and we'll be back when I do some of the decorative stitches. Okay, so now we're back and I'm about to start in on some of the decorative stitches. And so for the decorative stitch, I adjust this and I'm gonna be doing a fish, that's number 10. Now that wants to be at um, five, six, or seven. And that's a Roman five, six, or seven. So I'm gonna go all the way up to the seven and I'm gonna leave myself over here on the stitch length of seven. And we're just gonna give the fish a chance to swim. And that's the fish. Um, he's swimming along. It's kind of cute. It's not something that I would, you know, put on anything that I'm making, but it's a really, really cute stitch. So I'm going to go ahead and finish up with these um, decorative stitches so that I can have this ready to um, give to my mother, um, sister in law, and I'll be back momentarily. So. I have demonstrated or checked out all of the stitches on her machine and um, so when I return it to her I'm going to give her this so she can see that all of her stitches are working now which was something that she didn't have ha happening before but some of the cute stitches are the fish and this tulip, a puppy dog, some sort of a floral lace than these sailing boats, but unusually enough, there's some Halloween stuff and some um, basically baby shower stuff. These are swans. They're a little hokey, but they're kind of cute. And then these are bats. Um, I think that what you would want to do is try and get these stretched out and a little bit further apart. I wasn't changing too much on the machine. I was just trying to get it, demonstrate that it was working. And I, you know, I don't like to say, hey, I'm done with something and then be half done. I like to finish it completely. So while I'm sure that's not um, part of your quilting experience, I just wanted to share with you what I've been doing 
and um, what can be involved in getting a vintage machine back in running order. Um, it might not be your cup of tea, but I hope that it's something that you've enjoyed sharing with me. I hope to see you again here on Quilting on a Thread. Bye-bye.